welcome to the CEO series. Our guest today is Paul Keitzer, who's the CEO of Talent Games. He's the founder and CEO of Talent Games, a Singapore-based HR tech firm that pioneers uh, AI-driven, gamified, virtual hiring solution. That's gonna be an interesting topic. He's a renowned name in the HR technology space with over 40 years of industry experience. He's an official member of the Forbes HR Council and contributes his thought leadership insights on leading online platforms. Paul, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ron. Glad last, to be here. Good. Last time we met was in Karachi, I think it was, right? Was yeah. that? Yes. It was, it was, it was indeed. It was yes. indeed. I, was that your first time at that time or had you been no, before? No, I've been there a couple of times. I have some oh, clients cool. located in Pakistan. So I'm, I don't want to say I'm there quite a bit, but I'm there for, you know, fairly often. And I'm working on something now to possibly get back there virtually, or it could be, uh, you know, from the other side. So thank you for being a, a part of the show today. Um, interesting discussions we're going to have today. The topics are going to center around careers, technology, disruption and leadership. So I was reading your, uh, your blog post. It was very interesting to me uh, concerning the dark side of leadership. Four reasons leaders fail. And I'm interested in you walking us through that thought process. Four uh, reasons. I could probably name six or seven. But oh, I, I, can, <laughs> I, I, can, I, can, I can give you quite a few more if you want to, Ron. But uh, these, okay. were, these, these were the ones that I think not everybody at the same time think about uh, and i think they are they are uh, very much uh, uh, reasons for for leaders ceos or other other side of leadership to actually lead to failure from so so i think i think the first one that i've that i've learned throughout uh, throughout my career is that um, if you ask me what drives organizational and therefore business success uh, my my reading at the end of at the end of many many deliberations is that I do feel that for 70 percent it's to do with the leaders that that organization has uh, and of course uh, the, the CEO is the is the, the pinnacle of that but it is a uh, it's uh, but but it is of course the the larger concept of leadership within an organization and I've, I've been associated or I am associated with the result-based leadership uh, company from Dave Ulrich and obviously he's he's done tremendous amount of research on, on leadership development and hr and i think all his work uh, mirrors that that definition uh that's 70 percent i think i think it was if you look at i think one of the conclusions that he drew was that if you look if you ask investors why they put their money in a specific company it was about for a third was related to the industry that a specific uh, specific company was in. A third was to do with the financial financials around that company. And a third was about their confidence in the leadership of the company to deliver on a growth journey. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a huge amount of value creation uh, being associated to leadership. And we know all the stories and I've got wonderful stories of companies that I've worked with in which you see complete inflection moments, both positive as well as negative. Whereas a company is doing really badly and a leader comes in, they go all the way up. A transition happens, goes all the way down. It's like almost like a, a, a yo-yo. Uh, so I think both of us will have that seen those experiences. And I'm sure if I give a number of reasons why leaders fail, I'm sure you can compliment, uh, compliment that list uh, that list from. But, but I think a couple, a couple of them are, uh, so what, what I've seen and some that are slightly more on the fringes rather than the obvious one, is that, that, that the key component why a leader, leader fails is that a lot of the position, the power, and certainly in this part of the world, the amount of respect that we almost inherently give to a leader of an organization rises rises to the top of uh, of uh, of that individual uh, because a lot of these that respect that's been given is not on the basis of of the quality of the person but more of the the, the position that he reflects correct uh, and if, we, if we're not very grounded and not very humble 
that can be easily gonna gonna associate that kind of respect and that kind of uh, of, uh, of adoration with me as an individual rather than with the position that I uh, that I uh, that I, uh, uh, I uh, occupy. So I think I think that is that is a key component that I see leaders after a certain time not being able to stay grounded, not being able to stay humble, not being able to seek feedback, not being able to uh, to continue to connect with the front line of the organization and as, as, as a result start living in a bubble. I've got I've got a, a, a fantastic role model of a CEO that has been uh, I, he's currently he's, he's currently the special advisor to the uh, to the Pakistani Prime Minister. It's a gentleman called uh, Razak Dawood. Uh, he's now 75 years old. He gave up his uh, his chairmanship of Descon Group, which I think is very pretty well known in the in the Middle East as well. Uh, two years ago, when he was joining the uh, the, uh, uh, the the government, but every time you meet a person like Razak Dawood. He always talks about, he's always open for learning. He's always connecting to people that are on the front line. He's always keeping his feet on the, on the ground. Uh, he will never fly, and this, these are very small symbols. He will not, never fly business class. Yeah? Wow. So he, he at, at the 11 o'clock flight or the 10 o'clock flight, 10 p.m. flight I'm talking about here, going from one city to another city, you will always find him in this stack of paper on his uh, on his on his lap, going through memos, going through memorandum, and keeps on keeps on working. Recently, I tried to. Uh, I was sitting in the front of the plane. Uh, I was giving that seat, and not not business class, front of economy. And he was sitting somewhere in the back, in the middle, uh, in the middle seat. So I actually he's wow. 75. So I thought it was only normal for me to offer my seat to him. But he completely refused. He says, "I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take this. I'm just gonna sit in the middle seat and, and read my stuff." Yeah. So that that for me is an is an obvious sign of people that that are that will never get the the, the adulation that's surrounding them can yeah. come come to the head. Yeah. So that, sorry, go on, Ron. I was gonna say you can't teach that. No, you can't make. No, <laughs> well, I think I think it's not that you're being born with it, but yeah. I think it's very much around the, the role models that you're exposed to in your early part of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not something that you get on your 30th or 5th birthday, uh, but yeah. I think, I think yeah. it's something that that grows when uh, when you're being exposed and when you have a certain value system or being being exposed to a certain value system that then subsequently you make your own. I don't believe in genetic leaders, uh, but I do believe in early early development uh, in that sense. Early development around self-awareness, understanding who you are. Absolutely. Again, Absolutely. As a base point. Uh, so those, the four reasons leaders fail, I wanted to come back to that again because you, you mentioned humble. And, and, and the example you gave was uh, the type of individual we we're talking about. How do you think all of this has affected, has been affected, the style of leadership during COVID, this COVID period? And what can leaders take away, even if you're managing a small team of people and it's all virtual? Yeah, so, so I think, I think uh, I've recently, I've recently uh, for the first time in, I've worked for Unilever before, and uh, I've not worked for Unilever as a consultant for about 15 years because I don't felt it was appropriate. Uh, and uh, I, I needed to associate myself with other organizations after having spent 20 years with them. So after 15 years, I, I recently started to, uh, to do some work with their leadership team. And we act, I actually did a leadership uh, outbreak, as I call them, a top team session two days before the country shut down. Uh, so, so it was right before the pandemic. And the CEO is, was, was only being appointed six weeks before. Uh, so this guy has been appointed in his first CEO role and suddenly he's been, he's not only have the weight of, of a new CEO, a first ever CEO role, he then has to wait to of leading his company, which is a sizable company through yeah. a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and and what, I've, what I've really admired in, uh, as I followed him over the last six months are two things. One is his single and foremost uh, um, priority in, make, in engaging people and looking after their safety and well-being. Uh, and safety and well-being is not just the physical part, but specifically also the emotional part, 
uh, yeah. and often also the, the the financial well-being around around well-being as a, as a holistic concept. The other thing that I've seen him do is is very much uh, taking universe uh, universe uh, advertising away from product specific branding to much more purpose driven okay. purpose driven communication yeah. uh, and some very impactful uh, campaigns that he's run on a personal level as well as with company in order to highlight the, the, the front front workers, in order to rep- recognize the people that in his team are frontline, but not just Unilever people. But for example, there was a whole campaign in which he celebrated all field sales uh, individuals that were continuously being out there supplying uh, supermarkets or pharmacies. Uh, and that generosity of spirit of not using your money just to recognize and appreciate your own team, but actually a whole uh, function or a whole community is, I think, uh, a hallmark of that humility. Wow. So if, if we look at leaders and leadership development, if, if we had to start over again, and I say over again, and we're to, we're to put together a leadership development kind of seminar, what would be different? A couple of things that would be different ah. for the new version versus the pre-COVID version. Yeah, ob- obviously, obviously, the straight, the straightforward answer is around how do you how do you manage and how do you lead uh, in a in a in a virtual virtual relationship and virtual distancing work environment. Uh, and there's there's plenty of blogs and 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 communication that has been has been written written around that. Uh, but I think I think something which is slightly more holistic is I think, and that's something that has also uh, that has been a trend over the last number of years. But I think COVID has seen an inflection in terms of in term, and an acceleration in terms of attention towards is this whole concept of leading by purpose. Uh, and I think if you can't physically connect with people, you then have to find ways to connect through other means. And I think there's no stronger magnetic pool than having a common and a, and a, pre, and a, and a purpose that really resonates with people that keeps them together and keeps them moving forward. Mm. For someone that's in the process now of reinventing themselves as a new leader, maybe they were impacted through COVID, what kind of advice would you give to someone in that position trying to find another position, trying to sell themselves as a new brand or new and improved brand of leader. To, to an existing audience or to a new audience? To a new audience. I'm trying to find a new position. Maybe my position was redundant. How do I compete as a leader? And what are some things that should come out in that interaction? Yeah. Yeah, it is, to, to be honest, I think, uh, um, I've seen I've seen literally a lot of companies um, making quite drastic decisions around around who they should retain and who should they shouldn't retain. In the past, often it was focused on reducing the junior and middle level managers, but I've actually now seen that actually the focus has been more on the senior positions uh, because you can furlough or furlough your office staff for a longer period if you get rid of your CHRO or any of the other chief uh, chiefs that, that you have. Uh, so there's, uh, there's quite a few people that have, uh, have, uh, are now in a position that they indeed have to look out for new opportunities, where there are very few and far and far in between. Um, so I, th- I think, I, think I, wouldn't, I wouldn't therefore advise people specifically that this whole pack of individuals that are all competent are going to compete for the very few positions that are there. I think I think it's uh, my advice would now be very much to find an opportunity to completely reinvent yourself, yeah, yeah. To, to to transition and look for a second or your third career. Uh, and I don't mean retirement, uh, not 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 that whatsoever. And I don't mean the easy route becoming a consultant. Uh, which is the one that I took about that's 50 right. <laughs> Exactly. No, that, that, that's the easy route, correct? 
so you I, know, I, you know, let, let me stop you there because I see so many people say, oh, I want, I, I'm, I don't want to do that. I want to do what you're doing. I said, well, it may not be that easy. Exactly. But, you know, <laughs> the way you're perceiving is there's a lot going on behind the scenes. <laughs> And and to be honest, I've got a 50 year head start for you. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so so I think I think it's 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 an opportunity to really really see and reflect on how you can reinvent and have in any of those transformational moments, there are going to be completely new opportunities that that are that are out there. And uh, and I've seen some tremendous stories, and I'm not talking about HR or HR profession specifically, but if I look at what is now a number of transitions that people have made, and being able to still cre create and position themselves in a in a in a um, useful and and value creation manner has been quite quite remarkable. Event companies, for example, how they've tried, how they've transitioned themselves. Uh, so I, th I really think it's a, it's a moment to see how you can reinvent yourself and and focus on having that passion, having that purpose. Where do my where do my unique but what is my personal USP, and how can I combine that passion and energy and purpose that I have with the uh, with the uh, with the skills, unique USP skills yeah. that I have. And find a business model to support that. Yeah, I had a discussion with my daughter this morning concerning a job, and she she was looking, thinking about looking. And I said, "Don't look for a job. Look for a passion and try and take, bring your skills to play in that space. And this way, you're not going to ever stay there for 20 years, but at least you'll you, the the runway is going to be a lot longer." You yeah, the, the, only, the only thing that I always try to add when I have this conversation with people is to also make sure is that there is a business model in there in which you can live on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because just doing passion and uh, and uh, and skills means that I I might be training uh, dolphins, but I might might not be making a lot of money in training yeah. dolphins. Yeah, well, you know, you, you always want to make the assumption at least they they know how to figure that part out, you know. <laughs> oh, no, that's not always the case. <laughs> that's not always the case. You know. Your, your position is so unique because on one side, leaders, leadership development, and on the other side, I want to talk a little bit about, about, about AI and this new digitization. We can't go in and recruit the same way of having a person coming in. So give us some thoughts around bringing organization into this new way of finding talent. You know, when we were in uh, Karachi, your presentation was kind of blew me away. Um, and talking about this new process of, you know, unconscious bias and all these kinds of things that by using gamification and AI. So kind of give them, give our audience uh, an overview of what that's about and talent games. Can, can, can I do it in terms of a story? Um, because I think, I think making it practical in terms of a case study uh, is might, might, might be most, uh, most uh, uh, enlightening. So. How the, how the Talent Games came to fruition was actually it started off with me having a coaching conversation uh, with a talent acquisition manager of a large, uh, uh, large local organization. And that individual shared with me the, 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 the HR problem and the, and, the, and the business challenge that they say over the last number of years, the number of people that have applied for our management trainee program has reduced. We were the best employer for a num number of years, but over the last couple of years it's reduced from a couple of thousands to now only 500. And within that quality of 500 of applications that we get, this year we're only able to find two wow. quality candidates as management trainees. Whereas in the past they were the top three employer and were able to get 20 out of thousands easily. And th from that, that, that business challenge actually led to this idea of completely transforming the way that we hire specifically millennials. Yeah. And because the old fashioned way of, in this case, management trainees is you put a, you go to a university, you do a little bit of a big speech in front of a crowd, you give them in, uh, inter, uh, application forms. Subsequently, you, uh, you go through those application forms, you take a, a small aptitude test. That's the most boring of boring. People only come to your session in the in the university because they want that application form, 
And then suddenly four weeks, nothing happens. After four weeks, you get an invite for an interview and hopefully you're then part of it. So it's a candidate experience of absolutely yeah. a, a negative net promoter score, yeah, if, I, if I would guess that. So the whole idea was how can we do two things differently? How can we, first of all, attract uh, talent without actually having to make those presentations? And obviously, uh, social media is the obvious way to create a whole social employer branding campaign, teasing campaign in order for people to attract them to apply. Uh, and then subsequently we said, well, that should not be enough. What we then want to do is instead of an individual then sending in a resume and then doing a, a physical aptitude test, why don't we create a game? And that game is actually a reflection of what it is like to be a management trainee in that company. Yeah, so it is about real life scenarios uh, and whilst people play that game and get that real life work, ex well, the real life scenarios and therefore a realistic view about what it is to work in that company, can we test them at the same time? So then we put in a number of, uh, we put in a number of situational judgment tests in which we can assess how they would respond to certain scenarios. We would put in a aptitude test to assess them on a number of the reasoning elements. And then we put in an aptitude test in order to a uh, cognitive ability test to see their brain skills. And we developed the game within six weeks. And subsequently, instead of them getting 500 applicants, they had 7,000 people play the game. From 7,000, they just have a leadership board of the best scoring candidates then there were 200 that they that they wanted to take for a lot, for an interview and then the last fifth, the final 50 for them to do a, a panel interview and then within three weeks they were able to get 20 candidates and that's that's what they say that was the start and that's yeah uh, what, what's the what's the expression called uh, the rest is history <laughs> so the, the the advantage on the one that is of course the candidate experience and then on top of that Candidates are much more interesting to play that game. It's much more fun, much more engaging, much more realistic. But at the end, they also get an assessment of themselves versus everybody else that has applied. So they get a scorecard, they get development suggestions, which is God knows how much more than what they normally get, which is nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and on, the, on the company side, what you see is that because you do it very early in the process, you can significantly improve the quality of your pre-screening. Uh, I don't know what your experience is, but there's actually a scientific, uh, scientifically it's been, uh, been calculated that a junior HR manager on average looks for 7.3 seconds at the resume to decide whether he's going to be invited for an interview or not. Uh, so in that 7.3 seconds, you can only look at what university is from, has yeah. he got work experience, how old is his, what is his GPA? Yeah. Yeah, and all those four elements are of course biased because it doesn't mean that the person from this university is by definition better than this the other university. So by taking that out and giving them insights around everybody gave the same uh, level playing field, you take a lot of bias out. Uh, you take you can assess significantly more candidates than a HR person going through three thousand resumes. I don't think you want to do any <laughs> anybody that favor. And of course, you can do it faster and cheaper. So that was that. Was, that's the that's the that's the opportunity that we saw, and we've now yeah we've been lucky that we've been convincing 35, 35 other companies of the same benefits. Oh wow! Okay. We recently we recently went live. Uh, we recently signed a contract or an agreement with Nestle in Asia, Oceania, and Africa to use our gamified solution for the internship. Uh, today we went live in in, in China for Nestle. And we've been now live in 75 countries across uh, across Asia and Africa. Wow. So do you think that's demographic based? Because if you were looking for someone, say right out of college, they possibly could already be into games. And someone like me comes along and who does not utilize games or that whole concept, how does that play out? Or is it, a, is it, is it, is it, is it for entry level or is it for... Yeah, so, so, absolutely. So we, we, I, I don't advise to actually use the games for mid-level, mid-level and up. Okay. Uh, first of all, first of all, the, 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 I don't think that the ability to assess through a game is sufficiently 
uh, how do you say it, is sufficiently deep in order to make the assessment that is required for those roles. Okay. But for individual contributors or for first-line supervisors, absolutely. Uh, and most of those most of those individuals are in the tw in the 20 to, to to 30 35 years of, of age range, uh, and will be will be very familiar with that concept. And, yeah. Uh, Although, don't be surprised that uh, that some of the some of the mobile phone games are primarily played uh, by females in a in a in a forty year plus uh, age range. So, <laughs> so, so, so there's that program available on on the mobile. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a it's a browser based game. Uh, anybody can play the demo from our website uh, and uh, have a look what what it uh, what it looks like. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so we've now we've now assessed about two hundred and fifty thousand candidates over the last three years. Okay. Uh, so we've recently created quite a database of uh, of, uh, of of people, and which we've got significant amount of depth in terms of their knowledge. Well, you know what? I, I was reading your on your leadership blog, and, and and I find a quote that you said there was, and it was like, whoa! You t you really made it clear. You said rewarding and engaging the twenty first century talent. Using 19th century theories and 20th century tools. Yep, <laughs> recruitment has not changed has for, not changed. for at least seventy, at least well, hundred yeah. years probably. Yeah. Ever since we've been hiring people, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. The, the interview and primarily the unstructured interview, which I yeah. believe is still seventy percent of all hiring decisions, yeah. is the same as somebody did in eighteen hundred something. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we've, we've put in some new tools in terms of ATS, in terms of psychometric and assessments and uh, and uh, uh, group assessments. But those tools are all from the 50s, from the mil U.S. military in the 40s and 50s. There's not much news. Uh, OPQ, I think. How old is OPQ? Is about 50 years old. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's still something. And I'm not saying that OPQ is wrong. But it's still the old-fashioned way. The only thing that we've done, we moved it from paper to a screen. But it is as boring as hell. As you said, <laughs> the 19th century theory is the 21st century. The transition point over there. So yeah. if, I'm, if I'm a manager of a team, because I used a process like this at one time, I was doing team development, and I put the entire team through an assessment. But it was more of the older type assessment to see how well op how well the team operated amongst themselves. But could uh, this type tool be used for for that to get a sense of how well we are playing together as a team? Well, at the moment, at the moment, I've not uh, we've not gamified a specific uh, Belbin or a or any okay. of the other uh, any of the other personality type tests. I'm also trying to stay away, to be honest, from personality type tests for a couple of reasons. Uh, for, for first one is that at, at this point in time, there's not a real scientific uh, um, support yet of personal, gamifying personality type uh, assessments. So we can, we can do it, we have one, but there's no, there's no scientific backup in terms of validation. This, this, the second one is that, and that's a very personal belief, is that I don't, in my personal belief, personality should, personality traits should not be used in assessing whether I'm the right person for a job. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, you might think that I'm an extrovert, but uh, I, I know that I have to be extrovert here. But so I'm, how do you call it, an ambivert or something like that? So uh, does it mean that I'm not going to be a good consultant? Ambivert you want to be, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, whatever. Does that, does that mean that that personality trait doesn't allow me to be a good consultant? No, I don't think so. Uh, so I, I don't think that personality traits per definition should lead to job decisions. And last but not least, many of my HR colleagues haven't got a clue on how to interpret it, some of the personality trait uh, assessments. Uh, yeah. So uh, giving, giving that kind of powerful tool in the hands of people that don't know how to deal with it is also something that I'm a bit concerned about. Yeah, I, I always thought in a lot of cases it's like a check the box. Are you, are you guys doing psychometric? Yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this. But if you get beyond that and measure the value of it, there's nothing there. Absolutely. But um, check. 
Yeah, and and so therefore our our aim is also for to make it to make it very simple for uh, for HR professionals to understand it and to create a report reporting portal from which they can then easily understand and for whom to focus on. Uh, and, and yeah, helping HR professionals understanding that this is important. You know, your articles, are, for, the, for the guests, we're gonna give uh, Paul's website, uh, specifically the leadership development website. And you have some, some great articles there Thank um, you. that I, I read through. Uh, so here's some research you said concerning the current recruitment process. So for all of you HR people, 75% of millennials feel the approach is outdated. 50% of recruitment ends in failure due to unconscious bias. 90% of unstructured pre-screening interviews are 90% of the time wrong. How did they get so disconnected? <laughs> because those are devastating numbers. Those are devastating numbers. I'm, I've, I've recently started uh, read, uh, reading this, uh, the newest Malcolm uh, Gladwell book, uh, okay. Understanding Strangers. Okay. Uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And uh, he specifically uh, highlights, highlights a, uh, a research by a gentleman called Timothy Levin, I think. And the whole, the, the whole concept is that, uh, that we, get, we read strangers, uh, and an applicant is a stranger, correct? We read strangers most of the time completely wrong for two reasons. One is that we default to truth. So if somebody is lying uh, and it's not really in your face lying, then we default that it, it must have been right. Yeah. Or uh, there must be some truth to it. Uh, and secondly, is that we're not always able to interpret the, the verbal expressions of people uh, when, when they speak to us. Uh, it's very, uh, and Malcolm Gladwell always comes up with these fascinating research uh, elements yeah. uh, in, which, yeah, in which people think that, for example, their facial expression shows a specific surprise, but if they see them back, they actually they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so people not always, the, it's not, the facial expression is not always a transparency of how an individual feels. And as a result, we misread people significantly. Mm. Um, so, so, and, and, and to be honest, they also came to a conclusion that it doesn't matter whether you are a, a very bad uh, uh, lie detector like myself, yeah. or whether you are a CIA agent who's been inter interrogating people. A living, Actually, right? every, everybody makes the same mistakes. <laughs> yeah. So, what are you, what are you seeing from the leadership side? You know, so we're going through what I call now is the reimagining phase because you see discussions around what work is the future work, what is it going to look like, how are we going to re-engage with our people, what are some major things that you're seeing from your side in dealing with organizations slash leaders slash technology? In terms of reinventing leadership? In terms of reinventing leadership, re reinventing the workplace, there's so many reinvents that's going on. Have you... Yeah. Notice some key things that you that's popping up on your radar. Um, I, I see a whole spectrum, Ron, and I, I don't know. So, so on the one hand, you've got uh, uh, Tata Consultancy Group who announced that I think 50% of their workforce will never come back to the office again. Yeah, so, uh, as, as as drastic as drastic as that to other companies in which uh, they really want people and the majority are more slightly more uh, conservative. They really want people to be back in the office and to be able to, to continue to run as is. Um, I, to be, I really don't know what a new normal is going to look like. I really don't know. Uh, so because we're all now talking about that the new normal will be different than the old normal. I don't know over time, and over, at the moment we see these big spikes. I don't know whether over time these spikes will temper off and we come to a new, new equilibrium. Yeah. And it's, I, I find it so difficult to, to predict what that equilibrium could look like. Uh, if I, if the, the previous the big pandemic in, 20, in 19, 1918, uh, after a couple of years, I think everybody went back in a very normal pre-1918 uh, routine. Yeah. Everything is gone. Let's go ahead and do what we've been doing before. Yeah, so, so yeah. I, uh, I think there's a big chance that we hold our breath for two years and two years time, actually, everything is back to what, to what we thought it to be. The one thing that's not going to be back 
is first of all we've now everybody's proven to everybody else that working from home is as efficient if not more efficient than working from an office everybody has has been convinced that technology solutions are as efficient if not more sufficient than anything else um, I think everybody has has seen the uh, has, has 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 signed up, and that was again a trend. That it's not about shareholder value anymore; it's about building purpose-driven organizations. Yeah. So I think I think you you continue to see an ac acceptance of of these different components. But do you think that two years from now we'll never will still sit in a socially distanced manner in a restaurant? I, I don't believe. If we all have a vaccine, I don't believe so. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not going to be. They're not going to be concerts two years from now. I don't think so. So I think I think a lot of stuff will will bounce back to what it was. A number of new things will be added on to the to the old stuff. Yeah. So everyone pre-virus, there was a lot of discussion around the digital transformation. Various industries were going through that. I read about a car dealership that had extremely good sales during the period they were locked down because they had already built an e-commerce model for their dealership. The ones that did not are now trying to speed it up to get something online. Yeah. So this and digitalization process, even from, from what you were talking about, even in the recruitment, in the recruitment industry, it's changing everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've, uh, for us, we've been lucky. Yeah, we're in the right moment at the right place. Yeah. We started this three years ago. Uh, we saw a tremendous amount of interest of people sh window shopping uh, from March till June. And now we see that translated into buying decisions being taken. Uh, and luckily we've been there for three years. We built a brand for three years. We built a solution that works for three years and we can ride that wave. And for us, the big challenge is now, of course, anticipating what that wave is going to look like three years from now and start building that now. Yeah. Building as much as you can now. I was reading an article about Sixth Avenue in New York City, Avenue of the Americas, where all the corporate headquarters, 8,000 people in a building. And the building that they focused on was the old time and life building. Yeah. And they said, not eight to 9,000 capacity. Now they have 500 on a good day. Wow. So I, when you look at it, it's kind of cascading. So these are realtors. What are they going to do with all of these large properties? Absolutely. You know, so you look at New York City, what about the taxes and the returns coming from these buildings and people paying rent, restaurants, everything. So Absolutely. you're right. I mean, nobody knows where it's going. <laughs> no. The only thing is that, uh, what, what, what does Muhammad Ali says? Uh, uh, Everybody has a... No, we have, to, we have to dance on our dance on our toes, yeah. Dance yeah. on your toes, <laughs> so you can move. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I thought you were going to use what he says. Everybody has a plan until I hit him. Until I hit. Him. <laughs> that's that's a good one. And then it all goes out of the window. Uh, <laughs> what what advice would you give people that's been impacted, um, and are now out of work? I log into LinkedIn every day, and there's three, four, five people at least every day want to connect and trying to find work. Um, any positive message or in, from your side, playing both sides, leadership and technology and bringing talent in? Uh, yeah, the, I, I think the only, the, the only advice, a couple, couple of thoughts that come to mind. Yeah? Uh, but I think it's first, first of all, it's all about um, uh, reinvent yourself. Second one is all around personal, personal branding. Again, I've started personal branding in 2011, 12. That's when I started writing and push, push my, push my knowledge out. Yeah. Uh, I've got a f eight, nine years of, uh, of advantage now of somebody that comes to the conclusion, oh shit, I have to do that. Sorry for my English. Okay. No, <laughs> I, have <to> do, <laughs> I have to talk quickly over it. Uh, I have to do that now. But, but yeah, think about, think about how you want to be seen by others, how you can give value to others uh, and start giving that selflessly without any, uh, any, uh, any expectations of getting, getting back. Um, and I've seen some very success, very young people, some, some more senior of the last two years that have really successfully created a tremendous 
leadership grant for themselves. And I think they will never be out of a job. Even if they're out of a job, I'm sure that they will be able to monetize mm. some of the some of the, uh, the, 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 the the brand recognition that they have now in the market. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to write a book or do a webinar or write an article because I think that... And, that and believe me, everybody is. <laughs> exactly, that field is covered, yeah? <laughs> Again, you're too late, you're too late. So, so you have to come up with something slightly more event, inventive in order to, uh, to stand out and create a USB for yourself. Okay. So let's look at HR leaders that are listening in. What advice would you give HR leaders if they, as they're trying to scrap to straddle this, you know, employees on one side, leadership on the other, and they're kind of the nucleus in the center. What advice would you give HR leaders that's possibly stuck in their old ways? I, I, I was on a call the other week and talking about a CEO and, his, and their team, and the concern he had was he wanted everybody to come back to work because he says everybody is watching Netflix. Like, how did you arrive at that one? Is that what you, is that what you do? <laughs> when, you're, when you're supposed to be working because oh, Netflix just came out just like that. <laughs> yeah, but, but to, to be honest, I think I think uh, all all research shows that actually people have work, been working harder and more hours over the last six months than ever before. And yeah. the person that still believes that uh, that uh, that employees are slacking, uh, yeah. at least employees that can do the work virtually. Yeah, I'm sure there are there, there, there are jobs that can't be done virtually, but. Yeah jobs that can be done version he thinks that people are still slacking i don't, I don't think he's been watching or or he, i think he's been hibernating for the last six months or at, uh, at, least, at least he was telling on himself <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe. yeah. so in terms of in terms of uh, hr leaders and how to how to take this forward i think i think it would be a huge huge waste if we don't first understand what has made us successful over the last six months or how efficiency has stayed up how have we been agile how have we been able to respond because a lot of companies has been able i think majority of companies have found ways to respond in a very positive and meaningful manner so i think i think the first part is to to really observe and, and identify what kind of leadership behaviors have us have made us transition through these six months and then find an opportunity to capture that and then build or, and, and, and maintain that even when you come back to the office, even when we go back to a slightly different normal. What, uh, so agility, adaptability, response time, uh, holding yourself accountable, those are th really think uh, innovative creativity. Those are really things that in many companies have come to the fore for front line over the last six months which were not per definition capabilities that they had before. So how do you make sure, I think that's the big question at the moment. First of all, how do we safely return to the office? I think that's, we'll, they, that's easily been dealt with. A much more uh, intellectual question and, and value addition question is around what are the capabilities that made us successful in the last six months and how do we maintain those? Uh, Paul, so what do you what do you think, Ron? What do you think? Because well, I, I, my 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 view is only one part of this this conversation. Well, I play both sides because I work with leaders quite a bit, and I work also work with HR people. But I tell them that the whole mindset, if this fixed mindset organization has to switch, the culture has to be important. You mentioned the term the word purpose. To me, purpose is the new strategy. Why are we doing what we're doing? Who do we care about? Are we caring about our people? If that CEO were to deliver an online set session and was concerned about KPIs and the details and all these kind of things, you're gonna lose it. That whole mindset has to switch to a growth mindset and show that you care for people. People are struggling. You see it online every day. You, you, you're in discussions every day. People are calling you up. So from leaders inside, you have to be, you have to have that antenna up at full blast and try and pick up on those signals. One CEO told me a story, a good friend of mine told me a story. He said, since this thing started, every day he takes notes. 
And he says, I'm compiling those notes. He says, I have a binder this thick. So my question was, what are you going to do with that? He says, I'm going to, what I'm going to do with that is take that material, build something around it, start working with my senior team, cascading it down to minus one, minus twos down through the organization. He says, I've seen nurses or people without titles stepping into ad hoc supervisory roles, just taking charge. And I've seen people who had titles were hesitant in making decisions. He said, a lot of things are gonna have to change, but we've identified a new set of leaders. We've noticed leaders that we're gonna have to maybe possibly make some changes, but smart leaders do that. And they take inventory every week. They take inventory every day. What worked, what didn't work, and what can I do going forward to further enhance, whether it's the connectiveness of the organization, connectedness of people. You know, I use that term about the nucleus, so the, the employees are here, HR is here, leadership is here. That has to be made into one. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, everyone has to buy, buy in on that. Absolutely. Well, I, th I think spot, spot on it is this whole, whole getting people uh, al not so much aligned, but to energize them and to aspire them around a, 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 a meaningful purpose is going to be the big, uh, the big thing. I, I, I don't know whether you read, uh, this is my, uh, this is the latest uh, Simon Sinek book. Uh, I don't know whether you've read, uh, read it. That's my, I'm on Audible. That's my next one. <laughs> ah, all right, cool. Yeah. So, so yeah, he's, he's my favorite. He's my favorite uh, uh, thinking guru. And if somebody talks about purpose, it's him. Uh, and uh, certainly this last book, again, uh, does away of uh, this whole concept of this, uh, uh, this old fashioned concept of value creation and maximizing shareholder value. Uh, and it's all about how we can be, uh, play, play the game as long as we can. I always, there's another thing that I wanted to throw in is that I tell people, you have to use this period. What did you do during this three months, four months? What did you learn from that? Mm. It's not only leadership. What did you learn as an individual? I started walking. I started reading more. I had a list of books. You know how your bookshelf is full? Well, not my audible shelf was full. And because I started walking two hours, I can go through a book in three days. Mm. And I have a list and it's just been going away, going away. And just the thought leadership, Simon, I finished the other week, start with why, which is an older ver older book, but there's so much learning that can be done now and, and don't waste it. Yeah. And, 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 and learning is everywhere. From, from the open university programs to now Microsoft and Google uh, offering these six month certification programs. Yeah. Uh, around UX design, around data science, around uh, fantastic, absolutely awesome. Paul, how can how can the listeners contact you? What's your Twitter handle? Uh, yeah, so my tw Twitter is not my favorite. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big support. I'm not a big fan of Twitter. Uh, okay. But LinkedIn LinkedIn is my is my uh, social media to go to. So Paul Paul underscore Kaiser. Uh, you can also go to my blog, paul.keizer, uh, paulkeizer.com, uh, and the that's Telling Game. That's the leadership, that's the leadership blog. That's the leadership blog, that's correct, cool. Paul, paulkeizer.com. And then, uh, of course, on the Talent Games, the talentgames.com allows them to learn more about what we do in the uh, gamified pre-screening assessments. Okay. Paul, thank you for an interesting... No, that was absolutely awesome. Great. Thank you very much, yeah. Rob. Appreciate everything. And thank for the you. audience, thank you so much. Um, this will be on podcast and it will come across on other channels, our YouTube channel uh, in possibly a week's time. So thank you for tuning in and we look forward to our next session uh, coming up.